expect it was, you know, you're going to lose credibility. Cincinnati's Daily Paper has this To prepare for the challenge, IBM built a replica of the Jeopardy studio, hired a formal host, and even recruited former players to compete against. What is Hazel now? Thank you. This trusted friend was the first non-dairy powdered creamer. Watson? What is milk? <laughs> Holy no. Holy no. That was wrong. Maria? What is coffee made? Thank you. So the first time we saw Watson compete, it was tough. We had a lot of problems, but we're learning a lot about how to make Watson better at understanding language in different contexts and understand that in one context, the word means one thing and another means another thing. A garment worn by a child, perhaps aboard an operatic ship. Watson? What is pinafore? <laughs> yes. How did you get that? Very nicely done. To appreciate what a feat this is for a machine, just consider the opponent Watson is up against, the human brain. It can store an estimated one million gigabytes of information. By comparison, the most commonly used archive of the Internet is only four and a half times bigger. But Watson is not connected to the Internet. Instead, he's been stuffed with millions of documents, anthologies, dictionaries, encyclopedias, but no amount of information is ever enough. Because amassing facts is only half the battle, since Jeopardy is as much a language game Watson. as a knowledge what game. Is that? Watson? What is Smallville? <laughs> Smallville, yes. They come up with very sneaky questions that include slang and uh, puns and that sort of thing. So it can be um, very challenging just for the computer to understand what's being asked for, much less trying to answer it. And we couldn't write rules for every combination of word and phrases and context for every possible question or thing that Jeopardy might ask. Moreover, it was sort of my philosophical view that that's not the right way to approach AI. Instead, Watson has been taught how to compute the similarity between things by analyzing thousands of examples from disparate sources. This saint wields a candy cane-like lance in Il Sodoma's painting of him slaying a dragon. Watson. What is St. George? Good for 400. Where to, and so Watson? I actually looked at, well, how do we even get this one at all? And it turns out that from one document, we were finding this association with a painter. From this other document about dragons, we were finding out that St. George slays dragons. And so what Watson was able to do then was take the evidence from both of these and put these together. That is correct. Watson was winning about 64% of his matches by the time I had the chance to try to beat him myself. Jake. What is lanyard? No. Refusing to imprison this man for demonstrating during the 1960s, de Gaulle said, one does not arrest Voltaire. To whom are we referring? Jake, did you come up with the right answer? You had $9,400. Let's I don't take a look so. on your board I don't, I don't and see what did you say. <laughs> Who is Elder Camus? No. Watson, it's all up to you now, my friend. You had $41,805. What did you write down as your correct response? Who is Jean-Paul Sartre? Yeah. That right. is correct. Yeah. Man, he trounced us. Yeah, yeah. So how does Watson do it? In part, by imitating the humans he's trying to defeat. When you think of Watson from a hardware perspective with all its cores, you know, all its processing units running at the same time and communicating with each other at different points, does it sound like the human brain? I think at that level it does. Our brains are experts at multitasking, firing billions of neurons simultaneously to solve a problem. Likewise, Watson harnesses an army of computers. As soon as he receives a clue, they begin searching through millions of documents, independently gathering evidence, seeking out matches for the clue's words and phrases. After interpreting the clue in a multitude of ways, Watson comes up with hundreds of possible answers. The next thing that Watson is going to do is going to take those answers and say, well, let's assume all of them might be right. So these are its competing hypotheses. Once it makes that assumption, it takes each one and says, let me go and try to get evidence supporting this answer as the right one. In a sense, Watson makes an educated guess, processing hundreds of possible answers using statistics to see which one is most likely to be correct. And in the end, we get a list that says, here's the top answer, and we're 75% sure it's right. 
And that confidence is based on what we call an evidence profile, which gives you these scores that say, I like this kind of evidence, I like popularity evidence, you know, I like classification evidence, and all those things get added up to say, yes, I'm 75% sure I'm right, I want to buzz in. After Germany invaded the Netherlands, this queen, her family, and cabinet fled to London. Watson? Who is Wilhelmina? That is correct. Watson is the confirmed champion for this game. So does this amalgam of circuits and silicon really take us closer to the dream of a fully developed artificial intelligence? Can you speak Bocce? Of course I can, sir. It's like a second language to me. Surprisingly, even Ferrucci thinks we're far from that goal. I actually don't believe that, at least the way we program and develop computers today, you can actually create a human intelligence. To me, the question isn't how intelligent is a computer or, or how smart is a robot. It's how it acts in the world, doing interesting things and stuff that we want done, and it's, it's, it's a total interaction. And that's why it might be worth it to invest millions in a computer that plays a game. Because someday, it might do a lot more. Imagine a Watson-like medical assistant that could associate a set of symptoms with diagnoses a doctor might never have heard of or a Watson that could gather evidence for a lawyer. A thinking machine that could, in short, augment us as a sort of second brain. People wonder why you keep trying to build an artificial intelligence if you've got such a good brain. Well, there's some really good birds out there and they fly real well, but 747 is, is still useful and I'm glad we have 747s. We can learn from birds and build 747s. We can learn from brains and build useful artifacts. We know our brains run on electrical impulses. Every time we move or make a decision, electricity's buzzing among our brain cells. So imagine if you could tap into that circuitry like you do with a TV remote. You really shouldn't be eating that. Could you ever control another person's actions or thoughts? There's your check, hon. I'll get that. Seems like science fiction. But as correspondent Mo Rocca discovered, it's not. Imagine a magnetic wand that could control your brain. To find out if such a thing could actually work, I offered my own brain for a test. It seemed like fun at the time. Hold it up, you can look at it. Psychiatrist and neurologist Mark George said he could make my thumb twitch. Jeez, it does. Oh, that was nice. Using a map of the brain, he can zap the area that controls a specific body part, like my toe. Oh, wow. Is that nice toe? a little too much? A little bit. Yeah, a little much. One, two, three, four. The wand can even affect someone's speech. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. And once the pulse is removed, Everything goes back to normal. It's sort of a remarkable thing that one can put something over somebody's head and modify the way they behave. Wow. The wand works by producing a powerful magnetic pulse. So it doesn't look like a lot, but the magnetic field that it generates is about the strength of an MRI machine, of a very strong MRI machine.